Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our regular Tuesday slot. Um, we've been going through the various different aspects of nutrition and things, and we've just finished the series on children's nutrition. And just to take a bit of a break before we get into the next one, I'm going to do a Q&A tonight. Um, or at least I'm going to attempt to do a Q&A tonight. And some people have sent me questions. Um, I'm not mentioning names as to who sent what, but I'm going to have created a little bit of a PowerPoint with the questions and some of the answers. And please yell or send me a private message or something on the, on the side over here on WhatsApp. If I happen to be going too fast, it, I would like to try and get through all the questions. And if there's time afterwards, um, we'll have an open mic. And if anybody else has got more questions, you're more than welcome to fire away. And I will attempt my very best to answer them. So I'm going to mute everybody for now and then share my screen. Okay. Let's shrink down everything and everybody. So we are doing Q and A time, and the questions that I've received in no particular order is chronic nosebleeds. Why do we get them? And how do we fix them? So the fancy medical term for a chronic nosebleed is epistaxis. Um, simply put, a nosebleed is the loss of blood from the tissue that lines the inside of your nose. Nosebleeds, as I said, are known as epistaxis, are actually quite common. Some 60% of people will have at least one nosebleed in their lifetime. The location of the nose in the middle of the face, for most people, and the large number of blood vessels close to the surface in the lining of your nose make it an easy target for injury and nosebleeds. Um, there's a special reason for all those little blood vessels, and I'm not going to get into all of that right now, but this little blob in the middle of our face that we sometimes think is a bit of an irritation is actually quite important and has a lot of functions. If you have frequent nosebleeds, please see your doctor. Because this could be an early sign of other medical problems that need to be investigated. A few nosebleeds start in the back of the nose, right towards the back. These nosebleeds usually involve the large blood vessels that result in heavy bleeding and can be dangerous. And quite unpleasant too, because it tends to run down the back of your throat, you know, like a post-nasal drip. You will need medical attention for this type of bleed, especially if the bleeding occurs after an injury. The bleeding has stopped after 20 minutes of, of applying direct pressure to your nose. And that you'll do roughly about that area there. Jenny, the first aider, will can explain a little bit more about where and how to put pressure, but it's basically here at the top of the nose. An anterior nosebleed starts in the front of the nose on the lower part of the wall that separates the two sides of the nose called the septum. That's this little piece over here in the middle. Capillaries and small blood vessels in this front area of the nose are fragile and can easily break and bleed. This is the most common type of nosebleed and it's usually not serious or messy than serious. These nosebleeds are more common in children and are usually able to be treated at home. And that results because somebody's run into them while playing a game or you know, they've run into the wall or something along those lines. The posterior nosebleed occurs deep inside the nose. And this nosebleed is caused by a bleed in larger blood vessels, the back of the nose, quite near the throat. It's quite complex inside this whole deal over here. Um, and as I said, this can be more serious than the anterior and it can result in heavy bleeding, which may flow down the back of the throat. So if you happen to develop this while you are sleeping and lying on your back, 
it can cause quite a bit of a blockage in the back of the throat, which can be quite serious. And you may need medical attention right away for this type of nosebleed. And without getting too technical or um, grossing you out, essentially what they do is they've got to go in and if there's a, like a little artery over there that's bleeding continuously, they've got to cauterize it. And it's working a little along the same lines as taking a, a very thin soldering iron and sealing it off. It's quite, quite a fun thing to watch actually if you're in that type of the world. And this type of nosebleed is more common in adults. Most people will have at least one nosebleed in their lifetime. However, there are people who are more likely to have, to have a nosebleed more regularly, and they include children between the ages of two and 10. And this can be a result of dry air, colds, allergies, and sticking fingers and objects into the nose that make children more prone to nosebleeds. You know, changing the mind manually, et cetera. And I must say, um, if I spend too much time in Bloemfontein or a similar type cold area, my nose tends to dry out and there are sometimes indications of bleeding happening over there. But as soon as I get down into the warmer climes again, all of that goes away. And adults between the ages of 45 and 65, because blood may take longer to clot in midlife, and older adults, they're also more likely to be taking blood thinning drugs, such as daily aspirin or warfarin, etc. They may have high blood pressure or arteriosclerosis, which is a hardening of the walls of the arteries, or a bleeding disorder. Um, any of these things can cause that chronic nosebleed. Pregnant women are subject to nosebleeds because the blood vessels in the nose expand while they're pregnant which puts more pressure on the delicate blood vessels in the lining of the nose. As, I've, as I often tell the moms, babies are quite hard on mummies in the tummy. People who take blood thinning drugs such as aspirin or warfarin can easily start to bleed as well. And specifically, if the dosages have not been carefully worked out, they do have a tendency to bleed more easily. People who have blood clotting disorders, such as hemophilia or von Willebrand disease. And I won't get into all the fancy terminology, but these are uh, issues that can cause, um, well, basically are caused by a, a lack of blood clotting and can cause excessive bleeding. And the most common cause of nosebleeds is dry air. It's part of the reason why I think I like staying here at the coast because there's always humidity in the air. Dry air can be caused by hot, low humidity climates or by heated indoor air. So people who spend a lot of time indoors with an air conditioner running, regardless of the temperature, that air conditioner dries out the nose, uh, out the, the little tissues inside the nose, which can cause bleeding. And I found that that used to happen to me as well when I was, um, when I used to use a fan heater, it was great to warm the house, but it also dried my nose out a little bit too much, and I tended to get sick more easily as well. Both environments cause the nasal membrane, the delicate tissue inside your nose, to dry out and become crusty or cracked, and more likely to bleed when rubbed or picked or when blowing your nose. So if you have a good blow and you see a little bit of blood on your, on your tissue or your hanky, don't stress too much. Other common causes of nosebleeds include nose picking, colds or upper respiratory infections, and sinusitis, especially episodes that cause repeated sneezing, coughing, and nose blowing. Blowing your nose with force can cause a problem as well or inserting an object into your nose. Scarily enough, it's not just children that do that. Injury to the nose or face. You know, you've had a close encounter with the ground or with somebody's fist, or you've walked into the door or plate glass window, that kind of thing. Allergic and non-allergic rhinitis, which is an inflammation of the nasal lining. Um, excuse me for one second.
Okay. Um, blood thinning drugs such as aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, warfarin, and others, always read the fine print, or if you don't have the fine print, ask your pharmacist, because they will be able to warn you about these sort of things as well. People who sniff cocaine and other drugs that are inhaled through the nose often end up with damage to the tissues inside their nose and regularly bleeding noses. Chemical irritants, such as found in cleaning supplies, chemical fumes at the workplace, and other strong odors. And chemical fumes can include things like glue and thinners and dust, which is all the sort of things that I have in my workplace. Um, high altitudes, the air is thinner, so there's less oxygen, and drier as the altitude increases. So watch out when you're in Pretoria at convention. And people with a deviated septum, that's the, this little part here between the nose, an abnormal shape of the wall that separates the two sides of the nose. And it can be, there's some odd shapes that can be developed over here due to various different reasons. Frequent use of nasal sprays and medications to treat itchy, runny, or stuffy nose. And these medications, which are usually antihistamines and decongestants, can dry out the nasal membranes. Other less common causes of nosebleeds includes excessive alcohol use, bleeding disorders such as hemophilia or von Willebrand disease, or leukemia, high blood pressure, arteriosclerosis, which as you said was the hardening of the arteries, facial and nasal surgery, nasal tumors, uh, nasal polyps, which are, are little growths inside the nose. And if they get irritated or pulled on, they can bleed. Um, immune thrombocytopenia, which is a great big fancy medical term, but it's to do with um, a, a hyperactive immune system, which can lead to excessive bleeding there as well. Leukemia, which as we know is um, cancer of the blood. Hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which is a lovely, great, impressive sounding word, but hereditary just means you get it from your parents. Hemorrhagic means bleeding, telangiectasia, otherwise known as spider veins. So you'll sometimes have these in legs or arms, um, sort of early stage or thin varicose veins. Pregnancy, as we said. So how do we control this through diet? You know, there are first aid measures, which we won't get into tonight, but some of the, the more chronic conditions can be controlled through diet. Now, vitamin K deficiency is known to cause frequent nosebleed episodes, especially in children, because vitamin K works on helping your body to clot or helping your blood to clot. And the foods to include in your daily diet include things like iron, because iron makes up an important part of your daily diet. And iron deficiency is known to cause anemia, which further contributes to lethargy, bruising, and blood loss causing further epistaxis or bleeding noses. A diet rich in iron supplements like red meat, liver, seafood like lobsters, leafy greens, nuts, dates, vegetables such as carrots and beetroots should be included because that's where you're gonna get your iron from. Vitamins in our daily diet play an important role in maintaining the bleeding mechanisms and clotting factors in our body. Vitamin C and K are an important micronutrient which can help in preventing bleeding. The deficiency of such vitamins can lead to breakage of thin and fragile blood capillaries leading to bleeding. A diet rich in vitamin C and K include foods like your um, oranges, limes, gooseberries, red and yellow bell peppers, canola oil, cabbage and broccoli, etc. Zinc is another important nutrient which helps in maintaining the blood vessels in the body. And a diet rich in zinc from things like chickpeas, nuts and raisins, chicken, high fiber bread, brown rice should be made part of your diet. And if they're not part of your diet, please supplement. Bioflavonoids are a class of antioxidants which are found in citrus fruits and is known to strengthen blood vessels, thereby preventing epistaxis. And 
works the same principle as vitamin C. So I hope that helps a little bit. So from this, my suggestion would be that if you're not getting these things in your diet, some of the things in our range that would work quite well, obviously the vitamin C, um, the multi-mineral is another good one. Um, your carotenoid complex, which will give you your vitamin K. Uh, also, your um, cruciferous plus will give you your vitamin K as well. Uh, zinc, obviously, we know the, the straightforward chelated zinc, but also in the multi-mineral. And the bioflavonoids, you'll find in things like flavonoid complex and vitamin C. The next question I got was ADHD in adults. We've all heard and are probably familiar and most likely know a child who has got ADHD. How many adults do you know that have got it? Because many people have heard of ADHD, which is um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as opposed to ADD, which is attention deficit disorder. And it may make you think of kids who have trouble paying attention or who are hyperactive or impulsive. But adults can have it too. And about four to five percent of US adults have it, but few get diagnosed or treated for it. Now, some of the symptoms, um, you may find it hard to follow directions. Remember information, focus and concentrate, organize tasks, finish work on time so you're easily distracted. And these symptoms can range from mild to severe and can change over time. That's the downside of the human body in medical science. It's not always easy to come up with a diagnosis because a lot of symptoms are common to a lot of different problems. So generally in medical science, when a doctor is trying to get a diagnosis, they have to work out what the problem isn't before they can work out what the problem is. And ADHD may cause trouble in many parts of life, both at home, at work, or at school, dependent on the age. So some of the challenges, you may have trouble with anxiety, chronic boredom, chronic lateness and forgetfulness. So somebody who's always late or, oh, I can't remember where I left my keys. I can't remember where I left my phone. Where's my pen? That sort of thing. They have depression. They have trouble concentrating when reading. So to be able to read a novel is extremely difficult or even to read a reference book for that matter. They have trouble controlling anger. Maybe there's a lot of taxi drivers that have got this problem. They have problems at work. They have impulsiveness. They have low tolerance for frustration. They have very low self-esteem. They have quite sometimes quite dramatic mood swings. They have very poor organization skills. They procrastinate and they have relationship problems. And quite often they abuse substances or are addicted to drugs, alcohol, etc. Now it's quite scary because when you look at some of those um, symptoms over there, I can identify with some of them. Do I have ADHD? I don't know. Maybe a little touch of it. Maybe we all have a little touch of it. It's kind of hard to tell. And these people also have low motivation. So how can we improve these situations through diet and nutrition? So can what we eat help with attention, focus, or hyperactivity? Now, there's no clear scientific evidence that ADHD is caused by diet or nutritional problems. But certain foods may play at least some role in affecting symptoms in a small group of people because research suggests that, or research suggests, because ADHD diets haven't been researched a lot. Sadly, with Big Pharma out there, they rather investigate medication before they investigate food, because obviously you can't make a lot of money out of food. 
but you can make a, mod, a lot of money out of medication. So data is limited and results are mixed because to do some of this research costs a large amount of money and a large amount of time. And unless somebody is willing to get a good return on investment, they're not really going to be setting out a large amount of budget to get the results. Now, many health experts, though, think that what you eat and drink may help to ease the symptoms. We're not saying cure them, but at least make them a little bit more tolerable. So experts say that whatever is good for the brain is likely to be good for ADHD. So you may want to eat things like a high-protein diet. Beans, cheese, eggs, meat, and nuts are excellent sources of protein. You eat these kinds of foods in the morning and for after-school snacks, which may help to improve concentration and possibly make ADHD medications work longer. So we're not saying don't use the medication at all. We're saying assist it, boost it, and reduce it if at all possible. Because after all, why be on a chronic medication when you can be on a healthy diet or a healthy eating plan? We need more complex carbohydrates. And these are the good guys. We need to load up on vegetables and some fruits, including oranges, oranges tangerines, pears, grapefruit, apples, and kiwi. And you eat this type of food in the evening, which will help you to sleep because some people battle to sleep as well. We need more omega-3 fatty acids, and you can find these in tuna, salmon, and other cold water white fish. You'll also find it in things like walnuts, Brazil nuts, olive oil, and canola oils. And you could also take an omega-3 supplement. The FDA approved an omega-3 compound called Veyron as part of an ADHD management strategy. And I think we've probably seen and heard the stories about what happens with our omega-3, our salmon oil plus. Very, very good results over there. Now, some of the things you need to avoid, because it's not just enjoying, but you need to avoid as well. And the same goes with weight management, which I'll get into from next week. Things like simple carbohydrates. You need to cut down on how many of these you eat. Things like candy, corn syrup, honey, sugar, products made from white flour, white rice, potatoes without the skins because it's just plain starch. And some experts recommend that people with ADHD avoid things like artificial colors, especially the red and yellow dyes. Food additives such as aspartame, MSG, and nitrites. And some studies have linked hyperactivity to the preservative sodium benzoate. And this is why it is so very important to read labels because when you see these things in foods, you will not find them in natural food. Honey obviously is the exception to that, but honey is also, in my opinion, a healthier sugar. And especially if it's raw honey, that for me is a lot healthier than uh, refined honey. But obviously we know the story about all these other things. Read your labels on whatever it is that you are going to be eating because you're going to find a lot of these things hidden over there. Now, some of the recommended supplements, we know the salmon oil, preferably with all eight of the amigas, but especially must have the EPA and DHA. We need chelated zinc, brain food, just like omega-3 is. Vitamin D. Once again, people tend to spend an awful lot of time indoors these days. You know, those in the uh, hinterland, for want of any better terminology, are all sitting there cuddled up because it's cold outside. And in winter, we generally are more covered up, so we get less vitamin D. So in winter especially, it is always a good idea to supplement with vitamin D. For those who live in a slightly warmer part of the world, please get outside, spend a couple of hours outside. 
every day to get your vitamin D. Again, winter time, you generally have to spend a little bit more time outside to get adequate vitamin D, whereas in summer, not as much time. So if in doubt, take a supplement. We need to have chelated iron or a multi-mineral supplement. We need a full factor multivitamin with minerals and lipids and sterols. Magnesium is that little almost unknown or forgotten guy that is now starting to gather attention about how important magnesium is in our diet and how low it actually is in a lot of food. I need to spin this up a little bit. And herbal supplements with ginkgo biloba. Again, read the labels. The next question I had was about cholesterol. Cholesterol is a waxy substance that's found in all of your cells and has several useful functions, including helping to build your body's cells. And it's carried through your bloodstream attached to proteins. And these proteins are called lipoproteins. Now, high density lipoprotein or HDL cholesterol is known as the good cholesterol because it helps to remove other forms of cholesterol from your bloodstream. Higher levels of HDL cholesterol are associated with a lower risk of heart disease. LDL or low density lipoprotein um, can eventually build up within the walls of your blood vessels and narrow the passageways. Sometimes a clot can form and get, and get stuck in the, in the narrowed space, causing a heart attack or stroke. And this is why LDL cholesterol is often referred to as bad cholesterol. Technically, there is no such thing as good or bad cholesterol. There is just cholesterol. Cholesterol itself isn't the problem. It's when it stops and blocks up the arteries. That's where the problem comes about. So we've all heard about statins and one of the most overprescribed medications out there. And they are designed to help lower your cholesterol levels. And your body is capable of making all the cholesterol it needs to function properly. So cholesterol levels may be supplemented by the foods you eat. However, statins work in two ways to reduce your cholesterol numbers. They first stop the production of cholesterol altogether. So they block the enzyme that creates the cholesterol. Reduced production lowers the total amount of cholesterol available in your bloodstream. And this can lead to problems because our brain relies on cholesterol. Statins help to reabsorb the existing cholesterol. Your body needs cholesterol to perform certain tasks. These tasks include helping you digest food, make hormones, and absorb vitamin D. And if statins lower your cholesterol level, your body can't get the cholesterol it needs from your circulating blood. Instead, your body needs to find other sources of cholesterol. And it does this by reabsorbing the cholesterol that is built up as plaques containing LDL in your arteries. So how do we combat this? Number one, you eat foods that are rich in soluble fiber. And this is found in large quantities in beans, legumes, whole grains, flax, apples, and citrus. It is recommended to eat at least five to 10 grams of soluble fiber each day for the maximum cholesterol lowering effects. But benefits have been seen at even lower intakes of three grams per day. Soluble fiber lowers the cholesterol by preventing reabsorption of bile in your gut, which leads to the excretion of bile in the feces. And your body pulls cholesterol from the bloodstream to make more bile, therefore reducing levels. We need to enjoy lots of fruits and veggies. And eating them is an easy way to lower your LDL cholesterol levels. Eating at least four servings of fruits and vegetables daily can lower the LDL and reduce the LDL oxidation, which may reduce your risk of heart disease. We need to cook with herbs and spices because they are nutritional powerhouses packed with vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. And human studies have shown that garlic turmeric and ginger are especially effective at lowering cholesterol when eaten regularly. In addition to lowering cholesterol, herbs and spices contain antioxidants that prevent LDL cholesterol from oxidizing and therefore reducing the formation of plaques within your arteries. We need to eat a variety of unsaturated fats. 
because we know we get two kinds, both saturated and unsaturated. And if you eat more unsaturated fats and fewer saturated fats, this has been linked to a lower total cholesterol and bad LDL levels over time. So things like avos, olives, fatty fish, and nuts, especially rich in the unsaturated fats. We need to avoid the artificial trans fats. While they occur naturally in red meat and dairy products, most people's main source is artificial trans fats used in many restaurants and processed foods. So stay away from the junk food. Maybe an obvious thing, but eat pure added sugars. Um, eating too many added sugars can do the same thing as your fats, your trans fats. Getting more than 25% of your daily calories from added sugars can raise cholesterol levels and more than double your risk of dying from heart disease. So cut back by choosing foods without added sugars as much as possible. You need to enjoy a Mediterranean style diet, which are rich in olive oil, fruits, veggies, nuts, whole grains, and fish, and low in red meat and most dairy. Alcohol, usually in the form of red wine, is consumed in moderation with meals. Mediterranean meals are rich in fruits, veggies, herbs, spices, fiber, and unsaturated fats. So following this type of diet can reduce the cholesterol levels and lower your risk of heart disease. Now there's a, another odd one, eat more soy, because they're rich in protein and contain isoflavones and plant-based compounds that are similar in structure to estrogen. We need to drink green tea because green tea is made by heating and drying the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant. Drinking at least one cup of green tea per day can reduce your LDL cholesterol and lower your risk of heart attacks by nearly 20%. And we can try some cholesterol lowering supplements. Things such as niacin, psyllium husk, and L-carnitine can help to reduce cholesterol levels, but consult with your physician prior to consumption. Supplements recommended by Neolife include things like lipotropic adjunct, salmon oil plus, fiber tablets, or the all natural fiber powder. And then a couple of other quick ones that, I, that were sent to me. Carotenoid complex, a study was done on three capsules for daily optimum dose. The bottle recommendation is one to three capsules daily. Each capsule contains 300 milligrams of carotenoid complex, which is in a base of olive oil. So three capsules daily will boost your immune system by 37% in 20 days. Therefore, one capsule daily will probably take about 60 days for the same effect. One capsule daily is probably still significantly more carotenoids than the average person gets in their diet. Salmon oil, vitamin B complex, carotenoid complex, flavonoids, and chelated zinc are all good for brain health. Does mind enhancement work to combat dementia as well? Well, in my opinion, yes. By dint of the fact that the herbal blend has been shown to support alertness, memory, and concentration, and the ginkgo biloba may provide healthy blood flow, blood flow to the brain. So in conjunction with the others, it all works together to help to combat dementia, or in some cases, even start to reverse it. Calcium has been shown to lead to arterial calcification. How much is enough? On the basis of the most current information available, optimal calcium intake is estimated to be 400 milligrams per day from birth to six months, to 600 milligrams for six to 12 months in infants, 800 milligrams in children one to five years, 800 to 1200 milligrams for older children of six to 10 years, 12 to 1500 milligrams per day for adolescents and young adults, up to 24, 1000 milligrams per day for women between 25 and 50, 1200 to 1500 milligrams for pregnant or lactating women, and 1000 milligrams per day for postmenopausal women on estrogen replacement therapy, and 1500 milligrams per day for postmenopausal women not on estrogen therapy. Recommended daily intake for men is 1000 milligrams. For 25 to 65. For all women and men over 65, daily intake is recommended to be 1500 milligrams per day, although further research is needed for this age group. 
chelated calcium is a, is a different form. Therefore, less needs to be used in a supplement for a better effect without fear of buildup. And the vitamin D is added for better absorption. So only excess calcium will clog the arteries. Is it safe to mix a trusted sleeping tablet with supplements? If you're 65 or older, experts suggest that you avoid all sleep aids. This includes over-the-counter drugs and the newer Z drugs. Compared to younger people, older adults have a greater chance of health problems on sleep meds. And when you're older, sleeping pills tend to stay in your system for longer. And drowsiness can last into the day after you've taken them. 